Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. This is the uh, third of our four-part series on how-to spirituality. First week, we talked about how to pray and meditate. Last week, we talked about how to create a spiritual community around us. And today, I've been, this is the one I've had the most energy for, and I've been working on the longest. It's how to navigate dark times. I used to think, when I, when I was new and immature in this teaching of new thought, metaphysics, I thought, well, if I can just get my thinking straight, nothing bad's ever going to happen to me again. <laughs> Am I the only one that had that thought, or are those laughs of recognition? <laughs> and the shock when those losses continued to happen in my life, when my own mistakes in my own <laughs> life <laughs> caused uh, mayhem and pain and suffering for myself and others. It was shocking. And I thought, but I'm spiritual now. Am I, am I still being punished by that, other, that guy that we don't talk about much here in Unity, the devil? Is he still punishing me? And, it's, and what I learned is that this is a part of life. And from a metaphysical standpoint, the dark times are necessary for our transformation. It's part of the hero's journey for every one of us. So that's what we're talking about today. But I think we might need a joke first. <laughs> this one was handed to me hot off the press. Thank you. Lord, whatever you're baking outside, it's done. <laughs> Amen. Lord. So the first, actually, I have another one too. I didn't get to use it last week because I was so moved by, the, by Siobhan's music, I changed my, I didn't sell a joke. But this is uh, talking about how-to spirituality. This is uh, a quote from Oscar Wilde. To get back to my youth, I would do anything in the world except exercise, get up early, or be respectable. <laughs> Isn't that great? What I'm hoping to offer in this series is that you have choice. Life does continue to happen to us. Losses happen. Illness will happen. These things do happen, but we have choice, not that whether or not they happen, but how we respond. How we respond to these things. It's, we have this power of creative thought that is gifted to us by God. And we can choose to use our thought to recreate life circumstances in a way that more clearly reflect our consciousness of oneness. Or we can do my favorite response for most of my life was to go into, oh, poor me. <laughs> victim, 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 victim. And blame, see, victim and blame go together really well. It's a nice little sandwich. You know, just like bad things are happening I'm the only one who's ever experienced so much pain and misery, and, and it's somebody's fault, not mine. The dark night of the soul, I'm here to tell you that it's not if, it's when. It is not if, it is when. It is a part of the hero's journey from an archetypal standpoint. And as we experience this experience called the dark night of the soul, called the difficult times, called unexpected tragedies even in our lives, we are still at choice. And we are still invited into the experience of spiritual transformation or we can resist it. Guess which one I'm going to tell you to do. <laughs> so... Mary Morrissey is a beautiful teacher on this particular topic. Um, some of you know Mary. She created the Prosperity Plus work that we do here a lot when we teach um, those principles. She had a large ministry in the Northwest outside of Portland, and uh, a big tragedy happened in her life. Um, uh, her ex-husband had uh, absconded with millions of dollars from the church, and she was responsible. 
it happened under her, under her side. And so she um, lost the marriage, lost the church, and went through, a, and she's, this is not news, she speaks and teaches from it very publicly. It was her dark night of the soul. And she went for, uh, I think, three months on the Oregon coast in a little room just to grieve, and she walked the beach and just wept for days and days. This is not what she wanted. It was a betrayal on every level. And she said she took one little book with her, a little book written in the 1100s by St. John of the Cross, a Spanish mystic. And the book is called The Dark Night of the Soul. We think that that's where the phrase came from. And Mary began to integrate that teaching. And she said there are certain things, this is what St. John of the Cross said, certain things will happen when the dark night comes upon us. The first thing that will happen is we will do everything in our human power to make it go away. Oh, I've done that. Anything but this. (laughs) There must be, if I've got this creative power of life inside of me, surely I can affirm this away from me. Yeah, and sometimes we can. That's how we know whether it's a dark night of the soul moment or not. If our spiritual practice, our affirmation, and it's still here, we do it and it's still here, then we know. that This is, hmm. you know, I think the first person I heard say this was uh, the wonderful teacher Byron Katie. I don't know if it's original to her, but I love it. She says, nothing is happening to you. Everything is happening for you. And if we are going to navigate dark times, and notice I did not title this message, How to Avoid Dark Times. I did not title this message, How to Make the Dark Times End Quickly in Three Easy Steps. (laughs) How to navigate when, not if, these times happen in our lives. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put all of our power and energy into make it go away. And when that no longer, it's clear that is not going to work. The next thing that we must do is surrender. That is not an easy word for many type A personalities that we have in this church. I know, you've told me. I'm pointing at myself too. Surrender. How many of you grew up thinking that surrender was giving up? I did too. I've lost. You've won, I've lost. What I've learned in in spirituality and in my recovery story is that we have to give up so that we can win. We're giving over. I'm giving up my need to try to control and manage everything that's going on in the world. I trust that there is a higher power working in, through, in, and as me, and I can surrender Open, allow, let it be for God's sake. (sighs) And the next thing that happens after we surrender is the experience of release. Let it go. It was never your fight. It was never your battle. You were never going to win that one. You just got to let it go. And soon following that experience of release, you know, I could just... (sighs) If only she would do what I think she ought to do, it would be okay. We'd all be better off if she would just follow my rules. I can let that stuff go. And the next thing that happens is a feeling of relief. This may be news to you. You are, running the world is not your job. Does anybody else need to know that? (laughs) Running other people, unless they're little, is not your job. So to release the sense of needing to control everything, then comes this space of relief. Because here's the thing. These dark times, they're happening for us because the old way of being, our old thought structures and belief systems are breaking down and they needed to for our growth and transformation. And if we keep holding on, we're in just a world of hurt. But if we can surrender, release, The relief comes. And then Mary says this. She says that the, and John of God says this. Not John of God, I'm sorry. John of the cross. What happens next is a a strange feeling will overtake you. That you don't want this experience to end too soon. You want to receive every gift life is offering you in this dark night of the soul. 
Now, Mary said when she first read that in the paragraph in the book, she was like, well, I'm clearly not there. <laughs> I do not want this to last. I want it to be gone. I don't want this in my life, this experience of pain and anger and sadness. I don't want it. And that's the way we typically are at the beginning of this. But if we will just let the process take its course in our spirit, in our soul, in our body, in our mind, in our heart, trust it then what will happen is we will be transformed. We will definitely have to let go of some old understanding of who we are and the way the world should work. But on the other side of it is such freedom. It's a hard lesson today. It just is. I mean, and believe me, we're going to get back to some prosperity all August. We're doing prosperity. <laughs> But it's a hard lesson. There's a poem by Walt Whitman, which I read in my 20s, and it really struck me. And once I started speaking in New Thought Churches, I thought, someday I'm going to have the talk for that poem. And then I would read it, and it's like, no, that's too harsh. Today's the day. This is from Walt Whitman. There are who teach only the sweet lessons of peace and safety. But I teach lessons of war and death to those I love that they readily meet invasions when they come. It's harsh. And there are teachers in New Thought who will say, if you just come to our church and you read these books and you take these classes, all light and love from here on out. And I wish that were so, if I could spare you the pain. But it's not. That's not the way it works. So I'm giving you this hard lesson today because I love you and because I know what's on the other side of the dark night. If you're willing to surrender, if you're willing to let spirit, which knows how to sustain the entire multiverse, surely it knows how to get you through your dark night of the soul. The intelligence in God is greater than your ability to figure stuff out. No one has ever figured their way out of a dark night of the soul. The way we get through it is by trusting. So, enough of Walt Whitman. Let's go to Jesus Christ, shall we? <laughs> this is John 16, 33, which I've been preaching a lot on this lately. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus said it too. Prepare yourself. You're going to experience difficult things in this life. That's the way this life here is. But remember, this comes from the Gospel of John. We've been talking about this from a metaphysical perspective, and John is the most metaphysical of the four Gospels in the Bible. That we read it not as the man, Jesus of Nazareth. We read it as the Christ mind, the Christ spirit, the Christ consciousness, which is in you waiting to wake up. In this world, you will have trouble. The cancer diagnosis comes. The loss of a parent or even a child, it comes. The loss of the job and the career, it comes. These things happen in life. Every person in this room has experienced this, yes? And if you haven't, it will. It will happen. But Jesus didn't leave us there like Walt Whitman did. Jesus takes it to the next step and says this. But take heart. I have overcome the world. The power of the indwelling Christ, the power of this oneness, of knowing that God is here in, through, and as me, knowing this, I will overcome. I will rise again. You know, I have, I've been in a resurrection phase for a while, and I'm really happy about it. Whew, it's a lot more fun than the crucifixion and the dead and the grave stage, but I had to go through that too. <laughs> Do you hear me? When we follow the Christ path, those crucifixion moments, those dark nights happen, that the old ways of being aren't going to work. But Jesus said, take heart. I have overcome the world. Can you repeat that after me? I have overcome the world. And let that be the Christed one in you saying, I have overcome the world. All right. So this is a how-to series. 
This, I feel like I've set a good understanding. You know you have to surrender. You know that this is, can't be avoided. It's just part of it. But how do, when we're in it, what do we do, Michael? Well, come, if you <laughs> go back two weeks ago to week one in this series, <laughs> I gave you easy, simple ways to pray and to meditate. And let's just review The meditation is just some kind of a sitting or a being quiet practice so that we can unplug the computer and then before we plug it back in, let it reset. That's what it does. That's what meditation does for us. It's getting off that incessant hamster wheel of our thought, just some way to interrupt that cycle of incessant thinking, obsessing about things. And so I love the metaphor of unplugging the computer. Wait 10 seconds, plug it back in. Wait 10 minutes while you sit Observing the thoughts, let them be. 20 minutes, we can build that practice in our lives. And the prayer, that's what I really want to focus on for a moment. Because I I said it a couple of weeks ago, but I don't know that we all, I don't know that I heard it. So let me say it this way again. The simplest way to pray affirmatively is is to simply say, God is, I am. Say that with me. God God is, is. I am. Let's go back to kindergarten. Let's do it with body motions, shall we? God is... I am. Isn't that great? And any quality of the divine you can place in there. If you're experiencing depression, sadness, loss, you can say, God is joy, I am joy. Let's try that one. God is joy, I am joy. God is light, I am light. God is power, I am power. And even when we may not feel it, we can still affirm it. And so praying and meditating as best we can in these dark night experiences And then going back to last week, this has saved my butt so many times. (laughs) Y'all, spiritual community, spiritual friends, people who will know the truth for me when I can't see it myself. And if you've never experienced affirmative prayer after the service, our Unity Prayer Partners will be here to pray this for you. The thing you can't get to in your consciousness, they'll do it for you. And that's what spiritual community does. We know the truth for each other when we forget. And we all forget sometimes. The tendency in a dark night experience is to isolate. And it is a solitary journey. There will be some need for for some solitude. But not too much. You need to to check in with your people and let them know where you are. You've got to stay connected. We used to talk about in the 12 steps that how the the 10,000 pound telephone. You get it? When I'm in that isolated place, it's sure hard to pick it up and call somebody and let them know I need help, but it's important. That's about the best I have to offer you. Accept that this is a part of life. Surrender to that higher beingness that is the life of God. Living, I love what you said in the meditation, Reverend Anna, that like God knocking at the doors from the inside of us, waiting to be expressed and revealed as who we are. I think you said that. That's what I heard. (laughs) It's beautiful to surrender to that. You're not surrendering to cancer. You're not surrendering to grief. You're surrendering to this power of life that knows how to navigate this through you. And stop trying to control conditions. As much as you can, pray, meditate. Stay connected to those practices. Stay connected to each other. Find your tribe and let them know where you are. And one last thing before I do the next thing. (laughs) Lean into your faith. Lean into your faith. Somewhere I picked up the phrase, probably in recovery, trust the process. My dear friend Maggie Cole, who I talk about, but she never tires of hearing her name spoken from this stage. She and I have been prayer partners for well over 15 years, and we've gone through some really big, dark nights together. Not at the same time, thankfully. But what I, we discovered a few years ago as we were talking about it, we never doubt we're, that we're going to be okay. I trust the process of God living its life through, in, through, and as her. I never, never worry about it. And she says the same about me. She trusts that indwelling presence of life and love and power, knows what it's doing even when I'm hurting. You can lean into that faith for yourself and for others. <sighs> I have a story to tell you. 
It's a story you've probably heard, but I've been working on it, trying to get it in my own language and way to tell it. I like telling stories. And one of, you know, that will illustrate some of the points we're talking about today. And I call it the death of the caterpillar. I know it's really encouraging and uplifting. And I told you a hard lesson today. Would you prefer the caterpillar's tomb? Is that better? Well, just stay with me. We'll see how this goes. On a beautiful spring morning, on the underside of a milkweed plant leaf, a tiny, tiny egg cracked open, and out popped the most tiny, quarter of an inch long caterpillar. And she clung to that leaf, and she says, I'm born. And she had a sudden realization about the nature of her life, and she said, I am so hungry. And she looked around, and she didn't know what could be eaten and what could not. She was in the midst of this green, verdant, beautiful, glowing world. But what could she eat? What could she eat? And she felt a stirring inside her. Then she inched over to the edge of the leaf, looking. Maybe there's something beyond this leaf, my home, where I could eat. And there was just more green, more green. What to eat? And she looked down and saw that the edge of the leaf which she stood upon might just fit in her mouth. She's like, what else I got to lose? So she opened wide and she took a bite of the edge of that leaf and chewed and was so satisfied. Oh my God, that is good leaf. And she began to munch and chew on that life and just it was just joy, joy, joy. All that she needed, her whole world was edible. <laughs> what a gift. Life was supporting her at every angle. She was so grateful. She didn't have to do anything to earn this love. It just was there. And she said, my name is Grace. My name is Grace. I forgot to say that this story has three chapters, the way I'm telling it. They're called Grace, Faith, and Hope. Well, Grace continued to eat on that plant. She would devour an entire leaf just for breakfast or second breakfast, if she's a, from the Tolkien school of things. <laughs> and then she would go find more plants or more, more leaves there on that same plant, and then she'd look, go back a week later, and guess what? Where she'd eaten the leaf before the week, now there were two. Life was so good to her. She was living in grace and abundance, and she was growing, and she was growing. She was getting bigger, plump, and sleek, and loved her life. So good. This is where many of you early students in metaphysics are. It's so good. I'm affirming all this good stuff. I'm manifesting the three Ps, princes, palaces, and parking places. Look at me. Life is so good to me. <sighs> Grace just coming at me. Ain't life good? That's a good place to be. It's a perfect place to be. And one day, something changed. She was having her breakfast, lunch, dinner, as she was doing all day, every day. And she thought, I've got a strange feeling. Something I've never experienced before, but it's, it's here. What, what do I say? What do I call it? I just feel so strange. And, she tried to eat a few more bites. Maybe it would go away, but it didn't. It intensified. This feeling, I am full. I'm full. And she'd never experienced it before. Had no idea what to do with that. This isn't what I've come to love and want. I love eating more than anything, but I'm full. What do I do now? And she was confused, a little sad. And she thought... There's always been something inside me that tells me what to do if I listen. So I'm going to get quiet for a minute. And that same impulse that guided her to the edge of the leaf for her first meal said, go under the leaf to the base. and You'll find that you're able to attach your body there. Well, that's a strange thing to feel. But she did it and she hung there, confused, perplexed, not knowing what life was going to bring to her next, but she hung there and she noticed that her body wanted to continue to change and offer different things and she was somehow creating this hard shell around her own body and it felt scary. Like this is nothing like the life I planned on. I didn't ask for this. I was happy to go on eating forever. 
And eventually she began to see it was going to close her whole body within itself. She said, ah, I've come to die. This is my tomb. My body is building my tomb for the way, for my life. And this is what the dark night of the soul feels like. What I have known is no more. He's gone. It's gone. I can't do what I used to do. And there is deep grief in that loss, which must be honored and felt. And as she's feeling this process, which she assumes to be her own death, she feels everything slowing down, getting darker, and the walls that have been created around her are becoming opaque, and she can't see anything encased in this hard tomb, the end of her life. And as she's beginning to lose consciousness, she has one more thought. She thinks, every step of my life, I have been supported and guided. This may well be it, but I'm going to trust this process. My name is Faith. When I first heard the spiritual teaching of this metamorphosis of the butterfly, it was taught by Julia Butterfly Hill, Hill an um, environmental activist. She was in a tree for four months in Oregon, an old-growth redweed, to keep it from being cut, cut down. Young woman, vibrant, powerful. And it was at a spiritual conference, and she was telling the story of what happens to a butterfly and why she chose that as her name. And she was hoping to enlist us, enroll us in this idea that humanity has to change in the way we are in relationship with the planet. And the old ways have to die so that we can be reborn. In, in, and she would cry when she was telling this story. I can feel her passion and her pain of seeing so much destroyed. But she described the process of inside that chrysalis, when we can't see what's going on, the caterpillar's body disintegrates. It turns to caterpillar soup. Really, the body disappears from being a body. It's just this goop. And she said the last thing to happen is the head pops off. The last thing we do in our prosperity, I mean not prosperity, our transformation process, we're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I have no body, but I can make this work somehow. <laughs> We have to let that go. We can't figure it out. Inside that goop are these little disks called imaginal cells. They begin to rearrange themselves in a new formation inside that organic mess. And they begin to pull together new cells, new ways of being, forming a new body that looks nothing, nothing like the caterpillar. And in the right time, when that work is complete, the chrysalis becomes transparent. Let's go back to faith. Having had the experience I just described, one morning she wakes up and she sees the light coming through her tomb and she realized that she didn't die. This was not the end of her life, but she felt very different there was no great hunger, but there was a great need to push, to stretch, to move. And so she began to do that, and the chrysalis cracked open. And she began to come out of it, and this is not my body. This is new. This is not me. But it is. It's a new me. These long, delicate legs and this slender body and these giant, beautiful, colorful leaves upon her back. And she began to push the blood out into the veins of the wings and unfurl them. And after a moment, after she regained her strength, she flapped and lifted off the, off the leaf. She found she could hover. She could move further and further from the plant. She could see so far. Beyond the plant was a garden. Beyond the garden was a meadow. Beyond the meadow was a forest. Her world became huge. She was free in a way that she could never experience before the dark night of her soul. <laughs> and then something interesting happened. She began to feel a stirring in the very core of her being. 
that she would be a part of new butterfly life. There were new generations of life waiting to be born through her. As she was feeding on the nectar of the flowers, she realized she's pollinating these plants one to another. She's giving back. She's giving back. And she realizes that there will come a time that this life is over, but I see that I can be a part of a greater future. My name is Hope. My name is Hope. You three have stepped into such a sacred role. You're willing to give of yourself, of your wisdom, of your abilities and talents to help us all grow, to bring new generations of life to this community. Thank you. And that's the call for all of us, whether or not you ever have a beautiful stole handmade by Mary Fair around your neck or not. We're called into the next level beyond the limitation, beyond the apparent death of the way we used to be. There is a new life waiting for us in which we can give. Everybody who's been through the dark night, they're different. There's a different kind of light about them. They move more easily in the world because they know. It's going to be okay. And when we share our experience and our strength, our grace, our faith, our hope with one another, we are all transformed and lifted. Can I sing to you for a second? And to those who are in the Spanish ministry, I apologize. This is the third time you've heard this song in 24 hours. So, But it's my installation song, and I know that Cindy and Stacy haven't heard me sing it this weekend, so this is for you, this is for all of us. I am one of many with just one life to live. The gifts I have, great and small, I give them all I give. give simply purely from my soul I give here I am a vessel to be you spirit needs of me I will be I will be I will be with open heart I love with open mind I know the truth within me with open eyes I see the gift unfold I give my open hand for you to hold. Here I am, a vessel to be used, whatever spirit needs of me. I will be, I will be. Would you pray with me? That whether or not this is a dark time in our lives, we are open to letting that life of God live itself in and through and as us. So in this moment, we surrender any of our figuring it out mind. We surrender any of our egoic need to impress or to prove ourselves. And instead, we simply are saying yes to being ourselves.
us exactly as God has created us. So we surrender anything that stands in the way, anything that stands between our our mind and the life of God, anything that stands between our heart and the life of God, we drop it, we let it go. And we surrender into this stream of God's becoming, knowing that it will take us far from home, but that home is where we are. So we are cared for, we are loved, we are lifted, and we are willing to serve. That who and what we are is useful, and we say yes to bringing that gift to others. Whatever spirit needs of me, I will be, I will be, I will be. Amen. You. (laughs) You are amazing. If you don't know, Stick around. I'll keep telling you. (laughs) If you don't feel worthy of a life of freedom and connection and belonging, I'm here to tell you it's yours. If no one has told you today that they love you, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.